talking about piles for a while, and I want to just pause and ask you, what have you learned so far? What do you know? Teach me something you've learned about piles. I never knew that piles could be over 60 feet long. I think that's pretty incredible. What do you think the longest pile ever had driven has, has been? That's a good question. I would say 200 feet. Does anyone else have any guesses? I was very surprised when I found this out the other day. Over 700 feet. <laughs> That's crazy. That is crazy. So, wow. Don't know how they did that. I <laughs> don't know why they did that. That's probably very expensive, but maybe they're just trying to set the world record. It was like 760. Who knows? It could have been more than that, but <clears throat> impressive. Piles are deep, super deep. Sometimes they go down all the way to some hard layer. Sometimes they're just hanging out in soft layer and they're dependent on that friction. All right, what else have you learned about piles so far? Teach me. They come in a lot of different shapes. Shapes, sizes, materials. Yeah, surprising. Wood. Did you know wood piles can last for like ever underground in like a water saturated condition? That's just crazy. Forever. Um, However, piles in the ocean, they don't last forever. Why? Because there's biology in the ocean. Microorganisms eat away at it. Um, but if you have a pile buried in soil, in the ground, in water, it lasts forever. I don't know why. Maybe there's just way less organisms that eat away at it. But they've uncovered piles thousands of years old that were buried in the ground and they look really good. So... Of course, you can now chemically treat piles to help them last a little bit longer, but I was just shocked. Piles in the air, piles in the ocean water, or piles in the ground in groundwater. They all behave a little bit differently if they're timber, made out of timber. I think this might be jumping to conclusions, but isn't that how wood is petrified in the first place? Is it's buried hey, there you in go. water and clay? Yeah. I was act, I, when I lived in Arizona, we went to that petrified wood forest, and it was amazing. You could see all the little bark shapes on the pieces of wood the rings in there yeah so for millions of years it was preserved and then slowly as the different minerals ran through it they replaced the wood with minerals and they left a rock looks like wood my son actually took up pieces and put them in his rock tumbler and polished them up and they look pretty cool all right what else have you learned about piles so far Teach me something, anything. What, what's, what have you learned about piles? What pile capacity, piles, sizes, shapes, whatever. I need some feedback. There's basically just two factors that we account for for the how much a pile can hold, and that's the load the point can take and then the side friction load. That's right. So piles, pretty basic. A pile can hold whatever it's bearing on and added with the side friction. Some piles only have tip resistance because the side friction is negligible. Some have only friction on the sides because they don't bear on anything meaningful. Um, some have a combination of both. I like that. What else have you learned? You can build wherever you want with piles. Holy cow, yeah, you can build in the middle of the ocean an oil platform with a giant pile hundreds of feet deep going through 100 or 200 feet of water bearing into some muck, the ocean bottom. That's a pile, huge pile. Yeah, you can build anywhere. Holy moly. All right, what else have you learned? I didn't Teach me. realize. I didn't realize that sometimes when they have a really long pile, they connect them or weld them there on site. Yeah. How cool is that? You can keep going and going and going. I mean, that's how they brought, probably got to that 700 plus foot pile. It just kept welding on, going, 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 driving it in. 
What are the different ways that you can drive piles in? What do you know? I think there's the hammer and I, I can't remember if it's like a steam method, that's what they called it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, back in the day they had to use steam engines and bang it down with steam. Now they have diesel hammers. Does anyone know how a diesel engine works? Tell us how a diesel engine works, Adam. Well, it's only a little bit different than a gas engine. You compress diesel fuel to a point of combustion and um, it gets, the pressure gets so high, the temperatures rise and it explodes. And uh, you have a chamber and that explosion push, pushes a piston down, which turns a shaft. Um, and okay. basically just repeat that process over and over. Yeah, but there's no spark, right? It's this you inject gas into a cylinder and you compress that cylinder so much, the pressure gets so high, the heat rises until it hits the ignition of that diesel and it just explodes that piston out. No spark needed, just pressure. Well, a diesel hammer works the same way. You have a giant chamber, you raise a piston up in it, squirt a little diesel in, and then you drop that piston and boom, it, it falls down, it compresses so much that it fires it back up. They squirt a little more. And if you just put that up on top of a pile, the only thing you need to start with is lift that heavy, heavy piston first and then drop it the very first time. And then boom, you started this process. As long as you keep squirting in diesel every time it falls, that's what a pile hammer is. It's just, and they're heavy, they're massive. And just the weight of them. And so the, depending on where you're at, you order a different size of a diesel hammer or a driver. So that's good. There's also um, vibratory hammers as well that can vibrate them into the ground. All right, what else have we learned about? You can cast them in place if they're concrete. Oh yeah, we can cast them in place. We don't have to bring it to the site. Maybe you're in a difficult location and getting piles in and out, maybe you're on an island, who knows, you can cast a pile, lift it up and drive a concrete pile into the ground. We're also gonna talk about auger cast piles um, next week. So, <clears throat> okay, let's learn a little bit more about piles today, but uh, let me share my screen. Can you see that? Okay, so pile foundations, pile driving. So we've been talking a lot about how to figure out the bearing capacity and hopefully bearing capacity of piles remind you of chapter three when we talked about Terzaghi. Actually, let me stop. Stop this. Look at this equation right here. Can you see this equation right here? Look at that. This is one of my favorite equations. This is like from the father of soil mechanics. If you're going to geotechnical engineering, this should be your favorite equation. It tells you how much soil can bear, how much it can hold. It's made of three terms. It's Terzaghi's bearing capacity equation. It has a cohesion term, a surcharge term, and a foundation soil weight term. And each term C is cohesion, but then each of these N sub C, N sub Q, N gamma, that all, you know, everyone decided after Terzaghi invented this to add their own. And so you can, there's tables, there's ways, and you can figure this out. Um, if there's no, if you're just dealing with sand, of course, the cohesion term goes away. Um, BF, that's kind of the, uh, the footing width. When it comes to piles, we use this equation, but we don't use all three components of it. We if we're in sand, we knock out this cohesion one. And because the, the base of our footing is so tiny, it's just the diameter of the shaft, maybe one foot, maybe two foot, go up to 10 feet, but that's a big, big pile. Uh, we, we ignore this component. And so essentially it's just Q, the surcharge um, times some modification factor. And surcharge, again, that's just the unit weight of the soil times how deep it is into the ground. So the deeper you go in the ground, 
the more that soil is pressed together, it's tighter, and it can hold more load just because it's deep in the ground. So anyway, I don't want to, I can't say enough about, these are the fundamentals because when you're taking design classes, um, the point is not to memorize a lot of equations. The point is under, to understand theory. And so this is soil theory 101 right here, Terzaghi's bearing capacity equation and that the three pieces that um, go into it and a pile, um, walls, shallow foundations, deep foundations, bearing capacity, settlement, slope failure, it all is hinges on these, these soil 101 concepts that were kind of put together by Terzaghi. So, okay. Oh, dang, I covered the picture I really wanted to show. Um, <laughs> okay, we've been talking about bearing capacity of piles, skin friction of piles. I just wanted to show this table right here because I found it was a good summary. I mean, last time we talked about 12 different ways to calculate skin friction and five different ways to calculate bearing capacity of a pile. And here was just kind of a good summary. If you're trying to find this NQ, the surcharge factor right here, here's a couple different authors, Meyerhoff, Hansen, who knows how to pronounce that, Terzaghi. And you just start with this table you know the soil friction angle, and then you pop up, and then you come over and you can figure out this NQ factor right here. And who do you use? I don't know, but here's a good range. This is a range suggested for design. If you're a good engineer, you probably will not pop outside of this range right here. So while there are many um, authors who have suggested these bearing capacity factors, <clears throat> If you stay within this range, you know, if your n sub q factors, you know, based on your friction angle stays right around these ranges, you'll be safe. And um, anyway, just want to share that with you. There's more foundation books than the one we're sharing. There's probably 10 different foundations. I was talking to my buddy who was working on his PhD in uh, Virginia Tech. And I was like, share me your notes about soil foundation. And he had a, his book and his notes. And I was reading that. And it doesn't. None of his equations match the equations in our book. We have this book. It was written by who's the author, Doss. Doss, Doss, he writes a lot of books. I mean, he, the, these are the, I mean, it's kind of like Moroni. He, he abridged all these plates. He had so many plates and he had to choose the best. He saw our day and then he picked the best pieces that would match the times that we were going to deal with. And Moroni and Mormon, they abridged all the plates. Well, that's what all these different authors do. Doss, he abridged and he found his favorite um, equations for calculating pile capacities or whatever. And then another book, he'll pull in his favorites. On the, anyway, there's lots out there. That's the whole point. But what doesn't change is the theory. So the theory behind bearing capacity is it follows Terzaghi's equation. And what's the theory behind skin friction capacity of a pile? What are the three components that make that up? Who knows, Garrett, I'm calling on you out of the blue. Skin friction. What do you need to know to figure out skin friction? There's three general things you need to understand. Two about the pile, one about the soil. What are they? There's the perimeter of the pile. Yep, got another perimeter. Length. The length of the pile. Length. Oh, and then, oh, friction factor. Boom, friction factor. So that's the theory. You need to understand that. Now, friction factor, I mean, there's a million ways to figure that out. And the site condition that you're in can help you figure that out. And um, you may not know. And so what you may need to do is you may need to go out into the field and actually investigate this with a, a test pile or something like that. So today we're going to talk a little bit more about how you can go out into the field and calculate the capacity of a pile based on in-field pile driving conditions. And we're gonna talk about what happens when you have multiple piles and how you have a, a group, what's going on. But before we start, oh, I don't wanna take the time to bring up iClicker. So I want you guys to just look at this and tell me in the chat, what is the equation for work from physics? What do you remember work as? What's work? Throw it up in the chat, see what you guys got, A, B, C, or D. 
getting a couple of bees, lots of bees. Everyone's saying B. Okay, who would want to say anything else but B? After I, okay, I got it. You guys understand work. That is correct. Work is force times displacement. So if you're a hammer and you hit a nail, um, the force hitting that nail drives, or the force of the hammer drives the nail in a certain distance. Well, good geotechnical engineers took this same concept out into the field and they thought if you're driving a pile in the ground that's like work that's like hitting a hammer or hitting a nail with a hammer we could calculate how much work and maybe we can back calculate work into some ultimate bearing capacity of the pile so if you're not comfortable using all these equations in the book calculating your ultimate bearing capacity of your pile based off skin friction and end friction what could you do well you can go out in the field and so um Sometimes your calculations, you know, okay, I need to drive this pile 46 feet and it will be just right. But sometimes when you get to 46 feet, you don't have the capacity for whatever reason, your soil conditions were not what uh, you thought they were. They may have changed, that you may have not had enough uh, laboratory tests to adequately characterize or classify the soil conditions. Anyway, you're at a depth 46 six feet, but you don't have capacity. It's just going in the ground. It's just acting too soft. And so they wanted a method out there. So if you got to the depth you think you needed, but weren't seeing the kinds of um, blow counts are still driving in too easily, you could keep driving the pile and then weld onto it until you got to a, a depth where you, it was so dense that it was barely being driven into the ground by a hammer. And so there's equations that have been developed to determine the ultimate capacity of a pile during driving. <clears throat> so no calculations. Um, uh, this is purely field observations. And so ENR, Engineering News Record, has a formula and it's all based on the work formula. This should look familiar. Work equals force times distance. Well, they kind of said energy from the hammer equals pile resistance times depth of embedment. So they kind of modified this equation. They did a little bit more tweaking with it and they said the ultimate capacity of a pile equals the weight of that huge ram times how many feet it's dropping divided by the penetration per blow. So if you imagine if you tap on that pile and it goes down one foot for, per blow, that's probably pretty soft. But if you tap on that pile and it goes only goes down like one inch each blow, that's probably pretty dense. And so um, S is the penetration and then C is a constant. And it just allows you to jump from metric to um, English units. And so if you're doing, um, oh no, sorry, C is a constant, not at all based on that. I thought it was, but maybe it still is. But it's saying drop hammers use one, steam hammers use 0.1. I still think it has something to do with metric in US. But anyway, then after all that's done, you can apply this whopping factor of safety of six to your. Q ultimate, and that will be your Q allowable. So when you start seeing factor safeties of six, that just tells you that uh, engineers are, in the military, they call it rear guard action. They're protecting themselves from future litigation. So factor of safety of six is what you divide this by. But you're able to now kind of figure out penetration per blow, and you can kind of rearrange this equation even more. And um, anyway, this formula has been modified many times, um, but it's all kind of based on that formula of work. And so what it allows you to do is, and I've done this before, one of my first jobs as an EIT was to go out in the field. We were working by the Salt Lake City Airport, which was based on old ancient Lake Bonneville. And so it's a, a lake bottom bed with a bunch of silts and clays and a high water table. And the company was Lakeed Air. Maybe you've seen them, they, they just suck air out of, they take air <laughs> and they break it down to its components. And so they make liquid nitrogen, they make oxygen and they make helium and all these other things. But these huge tanks that they stored um, this condensed air in, all these tanks were on piles, bunches of piles all tied together. And so my job was to go out there and watch these 50 to 60 foot piles get driven into the ground. And my job was to keep recording how many was to write down on a log how many blows it took to go each foot. So at the top, one blow went like one or two feet. I was like, whoa, this is stuff. As soon as it started getting deeper, 
it was taking like 50 blows to go a foot. And so we were getting some really dense sands down there. And then we said, okay, you can cut it off. And so the engineers had come up with this, used these bearing capacity equations and said, if you're at these many blows per foot, you can stop. That pile has now has adequate um, bearing capacity to go on to the next one. And so we did dozens of these. There were so many piles, they were driven them all on the ground. And so anyway, there's formulas we can use now um, based on the field to know, all right, we've hit an adequate depth. We've got the bearing capacity we need solely based off of the blow counts. But, but you need a couple pieces of information like about the hammer, the drop height, the weight, and things like that. So there's a bunch of formulas to um, figure out this ultimate capacity. So here's that equation we talked about, the modified uh, engineering news record formula. Well, the Danish formula, there's another formula, Wan Bu, um, anyway, there's lots of formulas, like there's, I mean, that's just geotechnical technical engineering formula uh, for you, but let's just kind of look at this formula and break it apart right here. It's saying the ultimate bearing capacity of a pile is equivalent to the hammer efficiency, and then WR times H, that is the weight of the hammer, I don't know why it's not written in here, um, times the height that it's being dropped. Um, divided by, oh, we already talked about that. We already talked about S is the blow counts. And the average penetration per blow count can be written related to the number of hammer blows per inch. So S, another way to write S is just one over N. That's the number of blows it takes to go one inch. And so, and that's what SC is that um, modification factor. Oh, here it is. It, you use um, 0.1 if the units are in inches, and then you use one if the units are in um, SI. Okay, so then these are some new components to it. WR, um, that's the weight of your hammer. N squared, that's a coefficient of restitution between the RAM and the pile cap. Ugh, what does that mean? Coefficient of restitution is just based on when two uh, objects collide, how much energy uh, remains after the collision. That would have to be given to you. You'd have to understand. You know, are you taking a steel hammer and ramming it into a concrete pile or a steel pile or a wood pile? Each type of material has a different coefficient of restitution. Um, and then this pile, uh, WP is the weight of the pile. Um, WR is the weight of that hammer. And anyway, that's the equation. And if you know all these factors, um, and it gives you a couple of uh, typical factors of E that you could use. Um, the efficiency of the hammer. So some ha hammers are very efficient, um, some are not. And so um, they've got diesel hammers, drop hammers, drop hammers, that's what they did in the old days. They kind of used a chain and they, they lowered up this heavy weight and then they dropped it and the weight, boom, fell on top of the pile. Then they raised it up again and boom. And so drop hammers, not so common. Diesel hammers, uh, super co common. And there's uh, single and double acting hammers. I mean, those, there's just many different kinds of, but they're all essentially diesel hammers that, that drop a weight, and, but they just have different efficiencies. So uh, the point is, wow, now we can go out into the field and just knowing this number, how many blows per inch, we can back calculate and figure out if we know a lot about the hammer, wow, we can figure out our pile capacity. So this is, this is very common for engineers after they do all their design and um, figure out the using Suzaki's equation to figure out the bearing capacity, using the friction, figure that out. Then they still figure out the ultimate bearing capacity based off of blow counts. And then they send an EIT out into the field. So that may be one of your first jobs. And, and then just to count and verify, hey, these piles have reached capacity. So not only was I counting blows, I was checking to make sure that the piles were the correct batter, that they weren't tilted or leaning too much. And I was just making sure they were practicing good um, welding techniques as they welded on the next, um, branch of steel, things like that. So anyway, this is a, a neat way to um, do that. Any questions about this uh, new way to figure out bearing capacity of piles? Okay, uh, one thing I do have, I forgot to mention the very beginning. <clears throat> Next semester, I will be teaching 341. That's the introduction. That's the first soil mechanics class that you've taken, a prereq prerequisite to this class. So I'm looking for TAs. So if you need to be a TA, I'm actually looking for two or three TAs. I've got a big lab in the evenings on Tuesday and Thursday. There'll be a lot of students in it. So I'll need someone to kind of run around with me to help the different 
the groups, then I'll have to need someone to grade and I'll need someone to help uh, in class answer questions as a TA for homework. So and if you're interested, email me individually. Um, if you're sticking around next semester, and ideally, if you're even sticking around next year and you'd be back again, I need another TA for this class, but hopefully you guys will I'll be graduated by then. Okay. Um, sorry, I was just looking at my notes on my board before I did this example. So, all right. How would you figure out the ultimate bearing capacity of this pile? Um, there's two different ways you could figure it out. There's that modified EN formula. There's a Danish formula. There's Juan Boo's formula. Um, but the question is, given all this information about the pile, can you find the allowable pile capacity using these two formulas? And so, um, anyway, we can, I'm not gonna really just, this is pretty straightforward. You can walk uh, yourself through this. The, this example is exactly in the book on page, um, on page 610. Um, and it's not too tricky. You just slowly kind of work your way through this. It's 12 inches by 12 inches um, to figure out the weight of the pile and the cap. I think it has enough information for you to figure out all these little values in here. Um, if you're trying to figure out, oh, um, what's S? S is just going to be 1 over N, and N is just going to be you know the blows for the last one inch of penetration and so this is this eight this has to be given to you and this is what you can kind of decide as an engineer you'd say hmm when the pile is sufficiently embedded in a layer that i feel comfortable with i want to see it it take at least eight blows for that last one inch to go down and then i'll feel comfortable and that's and that's what you'd say and you'd probably create a table an excel sheet that you'd say okay at six blows per inch, at eight blows per inch, at 10 blows, 12, you kind of have this whole range and it would give you a different um, bearing capacity. And then you just have to decide from your table and what bearing capacity you need to hold up that structure. Okay, I need you know six blows for that last inch and then I can feel confident that I've got the bearing capacity that I need. So um, this eight is probably gonna be plucked off your Excel spreadsheet. Um, but but all these other values are pretty um, straightforward and given here. I think the trickiest one might be the, oh, let's see. I mean, C, oh, do we use 0.1 or do we use 1? Well, it's all in inches. And so in this case, we would use 0.1. Um, but then you just plug and play. But interestingly, if you um, calculate all these out, you've got uh, 101 kips, 104 kips. For the modified is 101, and the Danish brings you 104. That's amazing. That's it's rare that two equations get you that close to a value, but in this case, both formulas um, get you to the result that one pile with a factor of safety of four for this um, equation, a factor of safety of six for this equation, gets you pretty um, get you 100 kips. About that's a lot. Of, that's a lot of load. So. Anyway, if this is on the test, is there any confusion or questions about any parts or pieces of this, this equation to figure out your ultimate bearing capacity of a pile? And it's kind of interesting. There's not a lot of soil characteristics that you need to know. Most equations that we've studied so far, you gotta know something about the soil, like what's its friction angle or what's the cohesion, but this, this is like real world. You're pounding a pile into the ground and you know the weight of that hammer. And so you're actually able to fill out bearing capacity without knowing anything about the soil. So this is neat. All right, so the next question is, <clears throat> um, how else can you drive piles in the ground? Well, you can vibrate piles in the ground. And so the amplitude can be calculated um, I don't know if you understand how things how vibrate, but they have these two um, weights that are rotating that are um, that cause the, the vibration. They're unbalanced, and 
So they cause massive vibration depending on how fast they're, they're being uh, rotated. And then you just increase the size or the load, the, the static weight that's on these, um, these, ro these two concentrically rotating um, wheels. And that's, that creates the force of vibration. So not only can you calculate the ultimate vary bearing capacity based on um, pounding a pile into the ground, you can also do it um, based on vibration. But um, this is more used over in like Asia or Europe, um, not very popular in the US. Why? Because there's not as clear of an understanding between that relationship of load and rate of penetration, bearing capacity, when things are vibrating, you just don't get that same uh, good feel. However, there's an equation. Uh, if you have a vibratory type hammer, um, you can calculate um, the ultimate bearing capacity, but we're not gonna really get into that. But I just want you to know this is available as well. So just if, if you don't have access to a driving diesel hammer and you only have vibration, you can figure it out as well. Um, and of course there's, different um, folks who come up with different equations, like always. All right, but this is where I do want, this is gonna be on the PE test for sure. You're gonna have a question that's gonna ask you, okay, great, you know how one pile behaves. Maybe you can figure out the ultimate bearing capacity of one pile based on skin friction and bearing capacity or blow counts. Uh, you'll probably have one or, well, depending on what um, test that you take. I took the geotechnical PE exam, and so it was focused heavily on questions like this. So what happens when you have groups of piles, and how does that change the, the soil underneath? Does one pile, as you drive it into the ground, influence that second pile, influence that third pile? What if you had a group of nine piles like this, three by three by three, and um, you drove that first pile in, second pile in, third pile in, What's going on in the ground right here? We know that when you drive one pile in the ground, it has a zone of influence that goes around it. You know, as you, and this kind of, this picture explains it. But when you drive a second pile in, sometimes those zones of influence, they overlap. And so what, that could either be good or it could be bad. It could be good if that zone of influence is densifying the soil. Say you had a loose sand, and as you were banging that pile into the ground, it densified the soil around it as it was displacing soil. Then when you put the second pile in, it densified that overlap area even more than the first pile. Well, how could it be bad? Well, what if you were in clay and as you were pushing this in through clay, it was stressing that clay out. And we all know that when you push on clay too much, at some point it's gonna shear and slip along this sliding plane. And so too much stress in clay is bad. Clay can only handle a certain amount of bearing capacity before it fails. Terzaghi's equation helps us figure those things out. And so when you drive a second pile in, what's happening is you're stressing out that clay even more than you were with a single pile. And then imagine if you were this middle pile right here, there'd be some zone of influence around these, all these perimeter piles affecting that zone around the clay. And so if, if that's stress is so high that it shears, then all of a sudden you've lost capacity from this pile. It's actually not doing you any good. So there's this game that you need to play when you're putting piles in. Um, you're trying to get efficiencies, um, but you don't want to overload the soil too much where you start to um, fail it. And so how close do you put the piles together is the, um, is the question. And so um, <clears throat> what ties all these piles together is something called a pile cap. And it's just a piece of concrete. And I've got it on this next slide right here. So here's four different piles underneath. And then you've got one big pile cap on top. You can see there's rows and rows and rows of these. They're tied together by some grade beam. But what, what's important is whenever you have a, a group of piles, and these are pretty close together. Look, I would say they're like three or four feet apart. And um, they've got this pile cap connecting all these different groups. Here's another picture right here. Here's four piles in, These, this pile is in a little of a, bit of a batter, so it kind of helps it with lateral movement, but then in the end, you call this the, the pile cap. So um, going back to this, um, the load bearing capacity um, is when you have groups of piles, it's kind of complicated. They don't understand how it helps or hurts sometimes. Uh, a lot of research at uh, BYU from the professor who teaches the foundations class there, his name is Kyle Rollins, he studies um, group pile capacities quite a bit. And he um, is granted access to these huge diesel hammers and he conducts experiments. He puts little pile groups together and then he 
um, presses on them with these giant hydraulic rams until failure. And so, um, and I just think that's really interesting. So we talked about this, that stresses carried from each pile to the soil will overlap when the piles are closely spaced. And this could help and this could hurt depending on the soil conditions and how close you have these um, piles spaced. And so you can see your group of piles is notated as N1 by N2. So in this case, it would be three by three. N1 would be three, N2 would be three. So if you see these values in an equation, that's what it is. And L2 or LG is um, the length, the total length of the pile. And BG is the total width of the pile. And if you ever have an uneven number of rows and columns, say you had four, um, four columns and you had three rows, well, then it would be four by three. And then what one's L and what one's B? L is always the longer one. And so in this case, L would be uh, the length of all four of those spaced out and BG would be the length of the, the three rows. So anyway, we'll see this, these kind of notations in a minute. So I just wanna make sure that's clear. So how close can you space piles? Well, typically um, center to center spacing D is about 2.5 D in practice. So if you're um, <clears throat> up to three, D around 3D and more, you, you start losing your efficiencies if there is any when you have a group pile. But um, you can space them out uh, very far. But if you space them out very far, then they start acting like individual piles. You don't get any group efficiencies if there are any. So um, spacing is about three to five. So if you had a two foot diameter pile, um, 3D would be six feet. And so you'd space all these piles six feet apart. And um, Efficiency, you can actually figure out if you have, if, you, if your efficiency goes up or down um, by having a group piles. And it, it pretty much, it takes all of your um, individual piles, say each pile can hold a hundred kips and you had nine piles right here. Well, it could hold 900 kips individually, right? But then what happens if as a, as a group, what if that behavior densifies the sand or something a little bit better, um, then it would um, be more than 900 kips. Those nine piles maybe could hold a million or, or a thousand, sorry. And we can figure out this value right here represents the efficiency of a group of piles. So um, we can calculate what that efficiency is um, with this kind of complicated equation, but it's not too complicated. You use those values that we just talked about. N1, that's just the number of piles that you have, in this case, it would be three and two would also be three. Um, and you can figure out the efficiency of your pile. P, we know what P is, that's the perimeter. L is the length, F, that's friction. We've talked about that before. So um, groups of piles, they can help you, they can hurt you. So how do we figure this out? Well, the approach is a two-step approach. We have to first look at it as a giant block. And then we have to look at it individually and we have to just, um, then take the lowest value of those two. So when it comes to group piles, the first thing you, you look at is like one solid giant pile that has you know, a perimeter of BG and LG and BG and LG. And you calculate as one hue, what if that pile was just one giant pile? What would its ultimate bearing capacity be? And we're just talking about friction piles here. And when it comes to friction piles, you just have those three components that we talked about earlier. When I picked, uh, I think it was Garrett, and he said, oh, friction piles, it's the perimeter, it's the length, and it's the friction between all of those. That's all you need to know. And so uh, when you look at this as a giant block, what's the perimeter? Well, the perimeter isn't just gonna be the perimeter of this um, individual pile. It's the perimeter of this whole block. It's BG and it's LG. I mean, that's the giant perimeter as a block. And so what you do is you first, for friction piles, okay, well, what's the ultimate bearing capacity if I have my same average friction and then the perimeter, this giant perimeter right here and the length, calculate what that is. Then you do it individually. You calculate it for one pile and then you multiply it by nine and you figure out, all right, what do I have right here? What's better? And that will help you determine um, what to do or what, what kind of ultimate bearing capacity to use. And you use the lower of the two values. Any questions about this so far? We're talking about friction piles, putting them close together and how to figure out what the, the whole group is versus individually.
So if, if we are going to calculate just an individual pile anyways, and that's a limiting factor, then does it actually do us any good to put it in a block? Well, well what, what you're trying to find out, what if the block is even, okay, that's a good question. And um, so if the block gets worse, right? That's right. Uh, like we are saying, so if you calculate one pile individually and it is say a hundred kips, why would you even want to calculate the block? Because right, if, if the block is is better, you couldn't use it anyway. But what if the block is worse? I think that's the that's the reason you're looking at it. And then if the block is worse, why would you use the block? Well, sometimes you have so much load that you have to, and you have it all concentrated on a certain area. You have to group all your piles together, and so you have not many other options except to put all these piles right here. I mean, you do have a couple options of picking the perimeter or the diameter of these piles and stuff like that. But um, some cases you're gonna, you need to pack a bunch of piles in an area because you have such a high load over a small location. And your goal is to figure out what the ultimate capacity could be. And you need to make sure that um, you take into account the block and the individual, um, both cases to figure out what the lower one is and then uh, use that. Okay. Know, that makes sense. Yeah, so we don't use blocks because they increase our bearing capacity per se, but it spreads it over more piles. And oh, yeah, exactly right. Because in the end, you're going to put one big concrete cap over all of these. And so you're going to have one load coming onto that cap. And then that cap's going to distribute it to all nine piles. And each of those together have a group pile capacity. Yeah, and these are pretty, pretty close together. I mean, these are maybe six to 10 feet apart or something like that. Um, one thing that I need to mention though, is when it comes to piles, how many different layers of soil is the end of the pile bearing onto? The end only bears on one, right? That's right. It, yeah, the end of the pile ends up in one soil type. There's not multiple soil types that that end could be in because it's just a small area. But how many soil types could the skin friction um, be going through? As many as there are. Yeah, it could have, you could have two layers, you could have 20 layers. And so one thing to remember about these equations is uh, when you're trying to sum up this F average right here, if you have multiple different layers of soil and each soil has a different uh, friction between that steel or that concrete pile that you're putting in the ground, you need to sum them up individually. So that's just one important thing to, to remember. So there's a couple different equations to figure out if your piles are efficient or not. Um, I don't know. The only thing to know about this is if this pops up on the PE test or in, in industry when you're working, there's just multiple equations for everything. Um, so anyway, I'm just showing you these here so you know that there's not just one set way to figure out efficiency but they all based off pretty much the same things. How many piles do you have? You know, how many columns, how many rows? And you can figure out the efficiency of the group or not. So um, let's talk about the two steps in figuring out the ultimate capacity of a group of piles and some clay. So here's a foundation, a concrete foundation. It looks like it's on one, two, three, four. You got five piles right here, all acting as a group and it's five by three. So we probably have N1 is five, and two is three. And um, when it comes to clay, who remembers the, um, the bearing capacity, Meyerhoff's bearing capacity in clay? We talked about it last class. Does anyone remember that off the top of their head? Wasn't it nine times the area of the perimeter? Oh, well, you got Brandon. Wasn't it um, nine times the area of the perimeter times the cohesion? Yeah, that's right. So we're talking about bearing capacity. It's nine times the area times the cohesion of the clay. So when you're in clay, um, you can calculate the bearing capacity um, based off of Terzaghi's equations. Um, but Meyerhoff, he simplified it for us. When you're in clay, you could have um, QP equivalent to, um, and here it is, nine times the area times CU. And so the ultimate um, capacity of a group of piles is you take how many you have. So this, in this case, we have five times 
three, we have 15 piles, and they each have the ability to hold some load at their base, at the bearing end, the tip, and then they have some skin friction. And so the ultimate of that whole group right here is gonna be equivalent to this N1 times N2, which is 15 times nine times the area times the, the, the cohesion of that clay. And then it's gonna be the sum of all the different layers of soil that we have. And here, uh, I think last time we also talked about a couple of different methods to figure out friction. And we had the alpha method, the lambda method, the beta method, and Coyle and Costello's. I mean, everyone had the method. Uh, in this case right here, this is showing us the alpha method. And the alpha method simply said that friction equaled alpha times Cu. That was friction. And of course, you're still seeing perimeter and change of length. So now, this is, you're familiar with this. It's just friction times perimeter times length. And friction is defined a million different ways. But in this case, they're using the alpha method where you just say alpha is equivalent to, or, or friction equals alpha times um, cohesion. So <clears throat> step one, um, from, this is the equation for a single, every little pile individually. And then step two is look at it as a whole, as a big group with the ultimate capacity of the group. So you can figure them out just 15 times, you know, the, whatever they can hold and uh, based off friction and bearing. But then when it comes to a group, uh, we have to look at it as one giant pile with a perimeter of BG and LG going around right here. And so the skin resistance, it's going to be the perimeter or it's going to be PG, which is the perimeter still, and times the co. Um, What's that? The change in your length and then your cohesion. And so that's going to be your perimeter is just two times your length times two times your width times the um, cohesion times the, the length of your pile. And then when it comes to point bearing capacity, um, from Terzaghi's equation, the bearing capacity of a giant pile, I mean, you have to imagine like, whoa, what if you had a footing that was this big? What if your footing was you know, BG in width and LG in length. And you just kind of have, imagine this footing in the ground, you know, 50 feet or whatever L is. And then it has a certain bearing capacity. And um, that equation that we showed in the very beginning, um, that Terzaghi's equation for bearing capacity, um, it's kind of, it had a, a bearing capacity factor of N sub C in it. And so there's some charts that we can use to figure that out. If we know our, our length to base ratio right here, LG divided by BG, we come in here. In this case, it's probably like one and a half. And then we would um, choose which um, ratio line to come up to. We kind of find that same line, one and a half, LB to L, LG to BG, L over BG. We come up and we come over and our N sub C factor would be somewhere around, you know, seven and a half or something like that. So we, there's two steps. We have groups of piles. First, figure out how much load the 15 piles could hold. And then you got to figure out how much, if this was one gigantic pile, how much would that skin friction hold up with this giant perimeter? And then how much would the, you'd imagine that all that load being transferred down um, to this layer right here. And that would be your bearing capacity for your, your tip resistance. And you compare those two to each other, and then you see which one is lower, and that's the one that you use. So group piles, two-step process. Any questions about that so far? The last point is just compare the values, and then, like I just said, use the lower of the two values as your ultimate bearing capacity. So luckily, what we keep talking about, we keep pulling on concepts that we've studied in chapter three, and they keep coming back to us. Um, but let's just try an example really quick. See if we can put this together. So here we've got four piles in the ground, and it looks like we've got some clay. We have two layers of clay, 
And it looks like they bear, the end bearing would be bearing in this layer of clay, but the skin friction, uh, we probably have to do it in two steps. We have to use this 15 feet of the pile with these cohesion and unit weight, and then this 45 feet to figure out the skin friction on this part. We have to use these um, soil properties. So that's important to know. You can't just slap one value on here. Sometimes you have to do two or three layers. So if you had a spreadsheet, you could put as many layers as you want. So we have a three by four group of piles. So N1 would probably be four, N2 would probably be three. Um, they're square piles, this is their lengths. So we're able to figure out their perimeter pretty easy. So when we're trying to do friction, we need to know the perimeter, we need to know the length, and then we need to know some friction factor. Um, center to center spacing, all right, it tells us what D is, it's 35 inches. Ground wires at the surface, okay, well that makes it easy because if we ever have to use the, um, effective unit weight, we would know that we'd just take 112 minus 62.4. And this, the question is, using a factor of safety of four, what's the ultimate and allowable load bearing capacity? Well, the ultimate would be, what could all of this hold before the factor of safety? And then allowable is just divide that ultimate by four, and then that's the allowable. So when you see something like this, you should think, okay, piles. It's a two-step process. Figure them out individually. In this case, we have 12. So you'd figure out what the, the bearing capacity of one and the skin friction of one, multiply it by 12. That's one um, ultimate. And then to figure out the other ultimate, well, let's treat this like this big uh, rectangle that it is, three by four. It has a big perimeter. What would be the skin friction of that perimeter going through these different two uh, layers of material? Um, so that's kind of the strategy when you come up to group pile problems like this. You've just got to recognize it's a two-step process and you're going to choose the lower of those two ultimate bearing capacities that you get in the end. And then just make sure you're making, you're aware that there's, oh, there's two layers here. So I got to make sure I have got them covered. But um, this example is in the book. Let's see, the page is on, I think it's on page 623. It, it uses, uh, I'm gonna say some important equations. You need to write these down. Um, the, the equations that you're gonna first need is 11.121. We've covered 121 equations in chapter 11. That's pretty crazy. Um, <laughs> so um, to start step one, to figure out the individual capacity of each one of these and multiply it by 12, you're gonna use equation 11.121. And then for the group capacity, you're gonna use equation uh, 11.122. How many equations are in chapter 11? I'm just curious. It's up to 131. Don't think I've ever had a chapter in my school career that had 131 equations in it. So that will be your challenge on the test. As soon as you see a question, you're just like, nah, which one of the 131 equations do I use? But um, the good news is it'll kind of, the questions will guide you to what to use. If it's in clay, you're like, oh, okay. I mean, that gets rid of half the equations because half are for clay and half are for sand. So, um, I'm just looking at the book, just trying to point out anything that jumps out at me that's not straightforward. Because the equation 11.121 is, it labels everything as N1, N2, it has the yeah, we, we pretty much covered. There's nothing new that will jump out at you. You should be able to, um, when you're given an example like this, um, it, it should be quite straightforward. Um, something but, like, yeah. Uh, something that I, I don't know, because I, I already started working on the homework. Oh, Where do you find the equations for LG and BG? Okay, so LG and BG, let's go look at that. Okay, so L, G, and B, G. So L is gonna be the length of your, um, this is the length to the bottom of the pile. So in the problem that we were on, L would be 45 feet plus 15 feet, so that's 60 feet. But L, G, that is the length of the piles spaced all out. So L, G would equal, uh, in this problem, we would take 
four times, uh, it would be 35 inches because that's the space between each one. Does that make sense? Let me kind of draw that on. Yeah, I see that now. Okay, yeah. So we know that this space in here is 35 in our problem. And so it would be four times 35. Let's see, actually it would be three times 35 because we have four piles in ours. One, two, three. So our pile looks like this in that problem. And so to figure out LG, we would take that 35 inches Sorry, <clears throat> we take this 35 inches and we multiply it by three. And that would give us LG. And then to find um, BG right here, we just multiply that 35 inches by two. And then we'd be able to figure out BG. And so that's what, I guess I didn't make that clear. There's two L's in this chart right here. LG is the length of one of your sides of your pile group. And then L is the length of your, um, the depth that it's embedded into the ground. So, so okay. BG is the same in both of them. Good question. Any other questions? Okay, well, that pretty much uh, wraps it up for, for group piles. There's still kind of a lot that we didn't get into. One thing that we didn't get into is what happens with settlement when you have a group of piles. Uh, what happens is you put some load on this pile right here and um, settlement doesn't just happen like, it doesn't just pretend, oh man. So I do wanna make, cause I had a question like this on the PE and it said estimate settlement for this group of piles. And I was like, oh, I remember there's something about this. What happens is, when you're a group of piles like this and there's a load right here, um, you'd think, oh, well, if, if you had a footing, right? If I had a footing shaped like this, then the footing has some, it disperses the load through the soil and then all this soil um, settles and consolidates and there's equations to figure that out. Well, on a pile group like this, um, do we just take this area and treat it just like a footing like this and say, okay, well, Here's this area of my footing and it's got some load from above. So I bet it translates it um, through the soil like this and I can figure out the settlement right here. But if you think like that, you would be wrong. That is not what happens with a group of piles. Instead, what happens is, let me tell you, because I'm sure you're gonna see this again. What happens is that um, you come down two thirds and one third from the bottom of your piles is actually where the ground starts to settle and feel the load. And so it's from this point out that you're, uh, you would need to calculate your settlement. So whatever load's coming down here, you would start calculating the settlement at this point, you know, one third from the bottom of your pile, two thirds from the top, and it creates this soil pressure uh, distribution that's going down through the soil at a two to one slope. And it's, whoa. Anyway, that, that's important to, to just know. We don't have time to cover it right now, but I did want to just bring that up and mention that that's, if you read the next chapter in the book that we're not really covering about elastic settlements of group piles, uh, you'll see that in all the pictures. There's this cone of stress that's being pushed into the soil and it's you know from one third from the bottom, two thirds from the top. That's where you calculate and that's what's going through the ground. That's how you calculate settlement from there. Because there's always two parts to the equation. When you're, we've been talking about bearing capacity. Oh, is the ground strong enough? Is the ground strong enough? Well, maybe the ground's strong enough, but it settles four inches. And if your client doesn't want his, you know, air tower tank to settle four inches, then settlement will control. And maybe the ground could have held up that weight, but the settlement to get to that weight was just not tolerable to the client. I mean, some clients are okay with four inches of settlement. They just build everything and it all kind of sells four inches and none of the tanks are connected to each other. So who cares if they settle? Well, um, sometimes they are connected with pipes and lines. And if you have a line going into a liquid nitrogen tank and it settles and breaks, you know, that would be a problem. So um, we mostly cover bearing capacity in this class and probably the test questions will focus on bearing capacity, but just know that there's settlement always in the background that may control as well. So anyway, that wraps up piles um, for groups.
the, the last two sections are going to be on um, drilled shafts. And the project that I was just on in Arizona and Texas, they have hundreds and hundreds of drilled shafts. So drilled shafts are used everywhere. People like them. You don't have to transport all these giant piles from the steel factory to where you are. You just have to have a concrete plant and you can build a mobile concrete plant on your construction site. And then it's as simple as you know, drilling down in the soil, filling up with concrete and rebar. That's your drilled shaft. We're going to talk about what are the differences between a drilled shaft and then driving one in a pile. Obviously, you're not able to do some of the cool things we learned about today where you can figure out the bearing capacity just based on the blow counts per inch. Um, that, that is not possible with a drilled shaft. And there's other concerns like, oh, what happens if the, the shaft caves in and your perfect concrete column has irregularities in it? How do we figure those out? So that's where we're going to head next Monday and Wednesday. And then we got the final on Friday. So we've got a lot coming up this next week. So uh, email me if you got any questions, um, but we're getting close to the end. Thanks, everybody.